We like Q. It's Wednesday, which means we have another awesome podcast to get you over hump day. I'm here with my co-host, Barbecue Forte. Hello. And we're brought to you by ProQ, Barbecue Gourmet, and Smoke with Shack, our awesome sponsors. ProQ is dedicated to providing with quality smoking products with top-notch service and free advice for beginners to pit masters. And you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under ProQ Smokers. So if you're thinking about buying your first smoker, looking to upgrade, or even looking to pick up some epic accessories, check them out over at Max Barbecue. And Barbecue Gourmet is devoted to promoting real barbecue and supplying the UK and Europe with top championship winning barbecue rubs, sauces, marinades and accessories from the United States and around the world. And you can find them on Twitter and online under Barbecue Gourmet. So regardless of how you cook, whether it's on charcoal, wood, gas or electric, the real taste of barbecue can be yours all year round. And today we have Matt Williams from Oxford Charcoal Company with us today. Hello, Matt. Hi. Hi, Ben. How you doing? You alright? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Good, good. Yeah. Could you um it, just introduce yourself to the listeners and tell us like what your company is? Yeah, sure. Uh so uh yeah, I'm Matt Williams, uh as you said. Um I would be the master charcoal maker at the Oxford Charcoal Company. Um and I suppose we are I guess we're probably the sort of UK's biggest uh charcoal producer. Um we um, run a uh, couple of couple of quite cool kilns over here in Oxfordshire, uh, making uh, charcoal from sustainably harvested English timbers. Um, that's, that's kind of the nub of what we do, I guess. Cool. So you're from you're in Oxford, and that's where you get your Oxford charcoal name from. <laughs> do you know what it's the funniest thing when we're out at shows or festivals or whatever I'm generally I will have an Oxford charcoal t-shirt on the first question pretty much everybody asks me is oh whereabouts are you based <laughs> <laughs> but well <laughs> do you know what the clue is kind of kind of in the name uh, but I don't know I guess a lot of people use Oxford as a uh, as a sort of brand if you like but yeah it's prestigious are. isn't it <laughs> yeah I suppose it is yeah I suppose it is but um, we're we're based. Our kilns, I suppose, are three miles from the centre of Oxford, uh, as the crow would fly. Um, so yeah, we are pretty much right, you know, right in the centre. Yeah. Awesome. So Matt, wh- wh- where did it all begin for you? Wh- wh- what got you into charcoal? Let us know. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, it's a sort of. Um, it was an interesting little route for me. Um, because I guess you know most people who are kind of in the in the barbecue scene really have come into it because you know they like like food and cooking and what have you and eating um, and you know and, and eating yeah now I'm a big fan of eating uh, <laughs> but, but for me it was a bit of a different route so um, I've uh, well, I was I had sort of a, a career before uh, I got into charcoal making uh, I was a, a Thatcher for about twenty years. Um, so I was wandering around, you know, sort of playing sticks and straw and covering the nation's old buildings with <laughs> <laughs> basically very controlled compost heaps. Uh, but you know, it was, <laughs> it was good times. It was good fun. Um, whilst I was, uh, doing that, I just give you a little insight into where my mind works. So, um, we, uh, started to grow all of our own wheat straw for thatching. So we were growing sort of medieval wheat varieties that we'd got from seed banks all around the world and what have you. Um, and of course, when you thatch a roof, you do it, you attach all the material with, uh, twisted split hazel, um, uh, sticks. So I was coppicing, um, hazel and sort of working woodlands really, you know, as part of my sort of work in the thatching industry. Anyway, sort of time came really where I needed a new, needed a new challenge, a new thing to do. Um, and you know what? I didn't really know what I was going to do because, um, there aren't, a, there's not a massive amount of transferable skill really from being a thatcher to anything else. Um, but you know, at the time I was living in uh, the middle of a thousand acre woodland um, on the edge of Oxford, um, and I sort of figured, well, do you know what? I, I really, I really love working in the woods, uh, and I kind of feel like I have a kind of um, a sympathy, an affinity for the, for the woods. <laughs> Sorry, an affinity to the wood. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I'm better off away from people, really, most of the time. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as well to keep me out of the way if you possibly can. Um, so I gave myself a two-year period uh, and sort of thought, right, well, what I was going to do was go to the woods and just cut trees down all winter and uh, and make stuff for the rest of the year. So I was, uh, I was a shingle maker for a while. Uh, I was sort of making um, split chestnut gates and fences and uh, spoon carving and, you know, all, all the kinds of things that sort of hairy little hippies in the woods do with themselves. Um, <laughs> Remember, it's a family show. We don't want to know about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all very above board, you know. Um, <laughs> the motivation for me was this, was I was looking at the UK sort of forestry stock, if you like, and uh, something like half of our woodlands are completely unmanaged. And that leads to um, like a real degeneration in the quality of habitat that we have, in the quality of carbon cycling that, wood, that woodlands do. Um, and all this was on my mind, so I was kind of looking for a, a business to start, which is working from woods that other people wouldn't necessarily be interested in, to find a, uh, a product which, you know, which we could make on a large scale. So there'd actually be a bit of an impact into the way that our forests in the UK are managed and using that resource, um, you know, profitably rather than just letting the thing sort of stand around and do nothing. Um, so luckily for me, my wife was really ill for two years <laughs> and she didn't really notice what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't really noticed I hadn't really made any money for two years you know god bless her <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, then, and then she started to get better so I had to take it a bit more seriously <laughs> um, so I you know I made charcoal originally and this was this is kind of how it happened for me was that I had um, at the end of a season of making you know all the things that I was making for the woods I'd have piles of timber set around my yard and just because of the nature of the way I was working, they'd all be in single species. So I might have, you know, sort of a few tons of hazel, a few tons of sweet chestnut, perhaps some field maple, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and just really to clear my yard up, I borrowed a, a ring kiln, you know, sort of pretty traditional little charcoal uh, ring kiln, and just started making coal just to kind of use up the material that was left. Um, at the same time as this, kind of a peculiar thing happened. This was really the thing that kind of turned me on a little bit to the idea of cooking with wood and, and you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of fun things you might achieve. So um, I just finished uh, coppicing two hectares of, uh, well, majority hazel and filled maple. Uh, I've done it over the winter and in the spring, if anyone's ever done this, it's the most amazing thing. So you go back into a woodland, which the last time you saw it, you cut pretty much everything to the ground and it looks like you've, you know, <laughs> absolutely laid waste to a bit of woodland. But in the springtime, all those trees grow back from their root system. Um, there's like life everywhere. Lights got to the forest floor for the first time. So bluebells are flying up everywhere. You know, the place is kind of just alive and buzzing with bees and butterflies. It's just beautiful, you know can't help doing it again once you've done it once anyway i'd wandered back in to just go and spend a bit of time in the woods um and you know two muntjac deers had broken through our deer fence and had just gone around and eaten every single bit of regrowth um, like <laughs> every tree had come back I, was, I just you know can't tell you how gutted i was so i went home and uh i built a spit in my front garden that was just big enough <laughs> to take a full-grown muntjac buck, and um, then we went out and shot the little, uh, shot them, shot them. <laughs> 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 you did very well, there, Matt. No, you yeah. did very well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I try my best, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I got them home. Um, you know, sort of strung them up in the kitchen, sort of guide skins, got the things off. Now, thank goodness for Google because I didn't have a clue what I was doing really, but uh, it took me through the whole thing. Uh, so I had kind of, you know, a, a peeled deer ready to go. Um, and really, this was just a vengeance thing from my point of view. So uh, I got some of the charcoal and some of the wood that I'd made from the hazel and the field maple and just cooked both these deer off over, over a spit over this wood. Uh, and at the back of my mind, I was kind of thinking, you know, I wonder what's going to happen here, because this is the food that these deer have been eating their whole life. Um, 
and you know there has to be the flavor of that has to be within the meat of the deer and if i'm going to use the same wood to cook those animals yeah there must be a resonance there must be something that you're going to pick up which is just going to work um and it really did you know it was quite an eye opener and uh, that sort of set me off into a little flurry uh no <laughs> no small furry creature was safe in the woods for a while <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I had, um, I don't know, probably a sort of seven acre, uh, seven hectare um, sweet chestnut coffees. So we have a kind of little population of squirrels that pretty much spend their whole time just sitting eating sweet chestnuts. And you think, well, that's got to be amazing, isn't it? You know, they, that's got to be a thing that works. So we went and bagged a few of those and, uh, and cooked them over sweet, sweet chestnut charcoal. Um, and I started to sort of see that actually, uh, although, you know, you kind of think of charcoal as being a fairly inert thing, um, you know, if you make good quality charcoal, I guess you're aiming for about 85% carbon. It's not an awful lot of the original wood left, but it turns out that you hold enough of the sort of the volatile matter, if you like, from, from the wood, that you can impart not a big, punchy, smoky flavour, but, uh, but uh, a sort of a subtle essence if you like, of the, of the tree that you've, that you've used to make the charcoal comes through in the flavours. And I just love this idea, you know, that you picked up the flavour of the things that you, you know, the creeks you were cooking that have been eating the stuff that you were cooking them on. Uh, and it just, you know, it just really worked. Uh, do you know what? I've got no idea what the question was you asked me at the beginning of this. I just think well, I'm going to jump in there anyway because that's, that's really interesting to hear that coming from, from you, the charcoal expert. There's a lot of debate on whether charcoal gives flavour or not. But I actually, we were just discussing this the other day and... and when I cook over charcoal, you you get a different taste to what you get from cooking on the hob. You you do. It's not it's not all from smoking yeah. wood and stuff. So I'm with you 100 percent that you do get flavour from charcoal. And and the amazing thing about your product is that you have those single species woods, and you you can pick and choose what charcoal you are using. And I think that's I think that's amazing. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, we try our best. <laughs> but um, and, and a lot of it comes down as well to, um, you know, we've, we've given this a bit of thought. And um, from the start of our, you know, my, my little tiny charcoal production at the back of my house uh, in the middle of the woods, now we run, um, you know, like a really, really quite a big kiln. We built it ourselves, designed the whole thing ourselves. Uh, and it's um, we have a little computer in it which controls the temperature. Uh, so we know exactly what we're doing with, with, uh, when we're making the charcoal um, and actually you know having sort of found these things about charcoal and flavor then that has to feed back into the process so um, the way that our kilns work uh, right now actually we don't, we don't set fire to the wood at all we just have uh, essentially a great big um, oven where we put uh, sort of five cubic meters of timber at a time. In fact, there's always 10 because there are two chambers. Uh, whilst you're making charcoal, essentially what you're doing is just baking wood. Once you get wood to about 250 degrees, it starts to uh, go through a process. Yeah, it's a bit geeky now, I'm afraid. But you get this it's process. It's perfect for us. We thermal... love geeky. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So that's all right then. <laughs> so it's a, a thermal destructive distillation process that's what's going on so you're taking you know wood is essentially any three things really you've got cellulose hemicellulose and lignin um and those are just really long hydrocarbons and when you get them hot enough they break and as they break it leaves a fixed carbon content behind and everything else becomes uh, a, a volatile uh, and those volatiles you know the wood smoke if you like that comes off from traditional charcoal making well you know, it's pretty nasty, actually, in many ways. You wouldn't want to be releasing that into the environment too much. It's full of natural acids and tars and obviously loads of methane. So if you're thinking about the carbon cycle, that's pretty important. And I guess we might come back to that. Um, but we take all of that stuff that comes off. That goes into our furnace. We can bust it at 1,250 degrees. And that provides the heat source to keep the reaction running. Um, and now we could take the charcoal up to... Like if we went to maybe 600 degrees with the charcoal, you would really have pure carbon with a small ash content. You can't help that because some of the minerals in the wood are non-volatile, so there they stay. Um, and then really you just have a fuel, you know, something which is going to burn and give you heat. So we, depending on the species of wood we're using, we generally run our, our kilns up to sort of 370 to, to 420. We don't go past that. Uh, and we, we sort of change it up depending on what we're 
shark holing. And our aim is to go for approximately an 85% fixed carbon uh, content. You've normally got sort of 5 to 7% uh, mineral, uh, non-volatile mineral, which is your ash. And the rest of what's left is absolutely the distilled essence of the tree. Uh, so that flavor absolutely sits there and absolutely comes out. But it is a complex, you know, it's a complex task to really master that and make sure that what you're producing, you know, is doing the thing you say it does. Um, right, this weekend I did, um, I just did my Sunday roast uh, on the barbecue. I did uh, a leg of lamb and no smoking woods in it, just did it on actually on mixed species charcoal. Um, and I got the most amazing bright pink smoke ring that's penetrated about three quarters of, the, of an inch into the into the leg, I guess. Mm. Um, and you know, so you can see it's it's happening. You can see it's working. Yeah, point proven. Uh, yeah. Like, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I'll stop talking. Let you ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> We're just enjoying listening to you, to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. Like for me, like the real science behind. The whole of charcoal making because I've I've seen that you can like almost like buy your own little units that you can sort of have a go at yourself at home, but I was sure. n- never really thought about the like pure like all the science that goes behind it all and how like I just uh, thought just chuck a bit of wood in, get it hot. There you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> then I suppose that's a difference from buying yeah, like yeah. a premium, uh, like yeah. a premium charcoal from like yourself and then buying something mm. from <laughs> from the other other available charcoals yeah, yeah. in the UK. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so right, I, it, it, we always uh, in conversations. I always sort of get to this point where people are sort of saying, you know, well, uh, yeah, what? So what makes yours so different from anything else? And there are there are a couple of things. You know, obviously we do we, we really think about what we do to try and make the best possible products, and there's good reason for that because you know, our competition isn't other charcoal makers in the UK. Uh, our competition, you know, is uh, fellas in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, in the Amazon Basin. Um, that's where our charcoal comes from, you know. We import 60,000 tonnes of charcoal into this country every year. Whereas you're 100% British trees from sustainable woodlands. That's Well, yeah, actually, I should qualify that because we... So, <laughs> so right, pretty much everything we do is charcoal that we make ourselves from woods... Which we uh, which we gather from our local woodlands. Nothing comes from further than about twenty miles from where we're based. And then every now and again, we just get caught by uh, a little uh, a little thought that something else might be quite cool to have a play with. So right <laughs> right now, I've got um, uh, I've bought up the whole of the uh, orchard prunings from an orange grove in Valencia. Um, because I sort of figured the orange wood might be quite good fun. Uh, so, <laughs> so we bought awesome. an entire container of the stuff, um, bought it over, and we've been uh, cooking that into into charcoal. We also uh, we do it as you know, sort of smoking chunks and chips and what have you. Uh, but the charcoal, I just absolutely love uh, from that. But it was a, it was a sort of a funny little thing for us because we are sort of ferociously um, grown in Britain. You know, that's kind of what we do. But the point of that is that we can trace the sustainability of everything we do like so if you take one of our one of our um boxes of charcoal now we we can absolutely if anyone would be remotely interested in this uh i can take that box of charcoal and i can work back to the batch of wood that it came in from and i can take that back because we connect that then to a management plan from the forestry commission which which pertains to the wood came from and because that management plan will set out exactly what parts of the woodland are going to be felled in any given season i could take you to an area 100 meters by 100 meters and i know that the wood that's made your charcoal grew there um and we like that you know we, we kind of enjoy I like that, that. It's, awesome. like, it's like one of those things where you sponsor an orangutan from, yeah. like <laughs> I want to sponsor a tree and, and I want you, you find- to make it into charcoal. <laughs> and you can find out exactly the story behind it and you can get postcards. Can you start sending us postcards from our, our trees? Is that is that a future thing? Or we- <laughs> yeah, yeah, I certainly could. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I've been sitting in this woodland and this bloke came along and just cut me straight down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they throw it back. That's the whole point for us. Yeah. But anyway, you know, and then... We have this always have a dilemma with fruit woods because, uh, you know, people in the barbecue world are just desperate to have fruit woods. 
Yeah. Um, and do you know what? It's pretty easy to buy fruit wood if you don't think too much about where it comes from. So um, there's a lot of old apple orchards and what have you that get just get grubbed out um, because people are putting the land back to agriculture and what have you. So we don't buy that as a um, as a sort of point of um, of, of our. Um, purchasing policy we only buy fruit wood if it comes from pruning in a sustained um, management system um, again i don't want to make myself sound like an, like an absolute ass in all of this but i sort of figure that if we're telling people that you know we make a sustainable product you're staying true to yourself that mean that. About that. yeah right completely so when this sort of thing came up with the uh with the orange grove and um and it turned out that there was just going to be this great big annual pruning going on and there would be you know i think 75 cubic meters of orange wood coming off and i was like do you know what that just seems to fit really nicely with with what we're doing mm-hmm. and as a kind of as, just as a kind of you know a fun extra if you like to what we do yeah we went for it and uh, and bought some over um had you tried but, um, it out before did you know that orange wood was going to make a good charcoal already no i had no clue it? actually <laughs> Uh, I, I, I was just making some wild assumptions, you know. Well, so I'd used um, apple wood and pear wood, and uh, we make wild cherry charcoal as a kind of matter of course. So you kind of, you know, you start to get this kind of, you start to get the feel for what wood is going to do and, and what have you. And of course, if you uh, if you are thinking about it, then you go and look at the, uh, you know, at the, at the family tree, if you like. So um, this has led to a few interesting things. So, for instance, um, we, we make a, an English maple charcoal. Um, now, I don't know how many people are aware that sycamore is a maple tree. Um, so sycamore in the UK used to be called the great maple. It's, it's an acer. It's from exactly the same family as the sugar maples that you get from America and what have you. Uh, but it seems, you know, in the UK, we think of it as being a really unpromising wood. But we make a marvellous little charcoal from a combination of, uh, of sycamore and field maple, which are the two most common English maples, and you get the same, sort of, you know, exactly the same flavour profiles as you would get from the American sugar maples. So following that kind of logic, you know, sometimes you can just go and have a look and uh, think about a tree, kind of, you know, what, what the rest of its family are, what they're doing, do you know anything about them, and if you do, you know, do you like them, and if you do, there's a chance you can make something pretty cool. From uh, from sort of going down that line, um, and that's kind of yeah. So so uh, we were just kind of really hopeful mm. <laughs> that the orange wood would pay off. Yeah, you just got I to mean, know your wood. <laughs> yeah, ex- well, you know, because at the end of the day, it's all there, isn't it? You know, the information's yeah. there. It's a case of whether you can be bothered to go and look for it and find it. I figure, you know, the advantage for me is that most people probably can't. So, <laughs> so if I can be bothered, then perhaps you know, perhaps that's a saleable skill. Um, but yeah, the, when we get the first batch of orange wood, uh, I got some out, you know, you sort of go through a kind of a curing process with the coal after it's made and what have you. Um, and once it had cured, the first thing I did was just stick some uh, just completely plain um, sort of butcher's pork sausages uh, over, the, over the coal, um, offset it and uh, just let them sit and smoke for smoke you know it's charcoal it's not smoking heavily yeah. but sit and cook 40 minutes um and my god you know it was like so the flavor that came across was it's a bit like if you imagine like quite a deep marmalade but take all the sugar out so you've just got a kind of slightly burnt deep orange flavor mm. but with no sweetness and that's what came through with the with the orange with charcoal i thought yeah do you know what actually i think we're onto a winner here mm. so uh <laughs> so we I, need, I need some now <laughs> yeah, we, we'll order some. as soon as we finish <laughs> well, you know, this i'm ordering some <laughs> <laughs> so, so has the orange wood is that inspired you are you going to go down some more different fruit woods and stuff are you trying to source out some different uh different fruit woods and stuff at the minute or are you just gonna have uh, if well, it comes to it then you'll do it but not really looking it's well it's, it's a really hard thing isn't it because um i you know we've certainly absolutely the the crux of our business is about utilizing english forest woods uh, and that's that's always going to be where we're coming from it's always going to be our driving sort of principle uh but of course the guy that i bought the orange wood from keeps failing me up and going oh man well, <laughs> you know I talked to this guy the other day and he's got uh, an almond grove um you know and actually <laughs> 
neighbour grows peaches. What do you reckon about peach wood? Would that make a good coal? And I was like, oh, goodness. So <laughs> <laughs> I think essentially what, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to run with the orange wood for a while now. Um, and when we start to get through that, we'll we'll go and have a look and we'll find... Uh, we may see some guest things. appearances from some, yeah. some other yeah. bits and pieces. That's exactly it. I mean, you know, but then on, on the other hand, there are lots of things that we're, that we're sort of looking at and that we're dealing with in UK timbers that I kind of find exciting. So, um, it, like, we just managed to source uh, uh, a few Arctic loads of hazel, which is really tricky um, to get hold of because hazel generally is grown on sort of fairly short rotation. It's uh, great for making fences and what have you, but you don't get particularly big wood for making coal from. But of course, being a nutwood, um, similar to sweet chestnut, you know, you get you get those sort of same flavours that are carried in the nuts through in the wood. Um, so, you know, that's my, my next my next little thing at the moment is to kind of is to have a play around with the hazel, see what temperatures it works at, you know, make sure we can kind of follow that flavour through into the coal. Um, so that's the, the next little thing on my agenda at the moment. Um, I have a question. What what how would how would vine work? Because we started to see a lot of uh, sort of people talking about grapevine and stuff like that coming from. Uh, coming from uh, vineyards and stuff like that, so there's there's a lot of obviously uh, English English wines being made and stuff, and the, quite a lot of them yeah. that they have to. So would would vine translate into too charcoal, or is it too small, or or would that that be well, something that's possible or not? Or yes, yeah, fully possible. I mean, so, so someone sent me um, <laughs> someone sent me a load of vines from um, now. This is really interesting, and it really appealed. You can imagine. You'll, you'll see how this would appeal to my geeky side. So a uh, very nice young lady phoned me up and said, right, I've sourced vines from, uh, from the Bordeaux region, from, uh, from, uh, you know, from all these different sort of regions of France and from different grape varieties. And she's saying, well, you know, do you think there's going to be a flavor difference between like a Merlot uh, grape vine and, you know, a Chardonnay or whatever? Mm. I said, well, yeah, but there's, <laughs> there's just bound to be. There's bound to be. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, yeah, it really intrigues me. Um, although, having said that, I've seen... Uh, so I looked it up, had a look at how people are cooking vines generally. And it looks to me as if a vines are really quick burning. Um, so just the wood, you know, they, they just combust very quickly. Not a great deal of, um, of dense material there. Um, so it worries me a little that if, <laughs> if I can bring enough over to do it, um, there's, there's every chance that the charcoal is going to be a little bit, you, you know, of a, of a letdown. But do you know what? You just don't know. I mean, like, um, absolutely my favourite charcoal, my go-to charcoal for virtually anything is, uh, is birch charcoal. And uh, now birch as a timber, sorry, back into the realms of slight geekiness, uh, but absolute dry weight of birch is 500 kilograms per cubic meter if you, reduce, if you remove all the uh, moisture content. Well, now, that is um, really, really low. It's one of the lowest uh, weights of, uh, of UK hardwoods. But when you make it into a charcoal, you get a charcoal which is denser and heavier than oak charcoal. Um, now, we can have quite a long discussion about mm. why that might be. How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, just quickly, it seems to be uh, why it's the combination of, of chemicals the wood is laying down when it's growing, and it seems to be that it's the uh, the interaction between um, cellulose and lignin. And it seems that lignin pretty much becomes entirely volatile and doesn't really lay down any fixed carbon content. So what you find is you might have a wood which is really dense as a raw timber, but actually if it turns out that you've got really high lignin content in it, that you might end up making a charcoal which is really quite light. Um, so really well-made oak charcoal, so amazing for dirty steaks or something. Mm. If you want something which really is burning furiously hot, you know, that you can just whack stuff onto you and you're just going to get that searingly hot temperature. Great. And that's that's all I ever use it for. I don't use it for anything else. Um, other people are big fans, but um, but not so much for me. Um, but that that little, uh, you know, that, that little realisation that actually, you know, this unpromising little light timber makes, makes, in my mind, a much better charcoal than some of the things that you would 
it, yeah, immediately be thinking, oh my God, you know, oak charcoal must be amazing. Mm. Well, you know, some things it is, some things it, some things it isn't. So, you know, until you get the stuff and you run it through the kiln and try a few different techniques, um, you just don't really know. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, I'm sort of keen to have a go uh, with, with the vines, but I suspect that for me, it's probably it's probably going to be uh, in the autumn before I really have a, a chance to kind of fit that into the, the burn schedule. Um but yeah, definitely worth a little play, I think. Awesome. Well, that's that's cool, because from a birch point of view, a lot of people are really into uh, birch and, and silver birch uh, as a smoking wood as well. And I've just got some a couple yeah. of awesome bags from uh, our, our wood sponsor, Smokewood Shack, and, and, and I love it. I love the silver birch. Fantastic flavour. Goes with pretty much yeah. every a really, really sort of versatile smoke, actually. Goes with a lot of things and uh, something I'm really enjoying experimenting with at the minute. So that's pretty cool to hear yeah. uh, hear it coming from the charcoal side of things as well. And uh, I'd imagine that a cook with your sort of uh, your birch charcoal and your, your birch smoke would be a, a pretty epic cook. So it's just something else we're going to have to pick yeah, up yeah. after after the uh, <laughs> podcast is over. So would birch be your <laughs> like, longest-lasting charcoal then? Um, oh, goodness. It, well, right, so people ask that all the time. And people say, oh, you know, lumpwood charcoal doesn't last as long as this charcoal. And, yeah, yeah. Right, here's the thing. So charcoal, at the kind of um, carbon contents that we're talking about, has pretty much got um, 8,000 uh, kilowatt hours per tonne. So uh, so 10 kilos, you know, you've got 8 kilowatt hours in, in that charcoal. So that's just the, the pure energy content of the stuff. Now, you can release that in a few different ways. Now, we have people who use our charcoal to smelt iron, um, who are sort of making cast iron sculptures and what have you. And what they'll do is just run, you know, like run a fan and just push air in. So you release that energy in a really short period of time. doesn't matter to them what kind of charcoal I give them because they're just going to force it to release its energy and it's going to be hot. Mm. Um so when you're cooking in a in a barbecue, you know, if you put half kilo of charcoal in, actually the energy content of that half kilo of charcoal, if it's a lump of charcoal and if it's well made, you know, you've got four kilowatt hours uh, of, of energy. Now, some uh, some of the charcoals lend themselves to being much easier to control. So. Um, like oak, for instance, when you make it into a charcoal, it, um, the wood obviously shrinks uh, as you're um, as you're drying it and then you know thermally decomposing it. And in oak, you get um, fractures which are radial, so the wood will um, will split from bark to centre. Mm-hmm. If you like, does that but all around the wood, uh, and you can see those marks in the wood before you cook it making itself pretty obvious that's what it does so when you've got the charcoal um there is quite a lot of exposed surface area because there are fractures through the coal in every piece uh which go all the way through the piece of charcoal so when you're burning it it just wants to suck air in and it wants to burn hot uh and then you get other charcoals like birch is a particularly fine example of this where the the wood just doesn't really fracture when you make it into a charcoal, which seems to shrink in a very organised way, and you get um, sort of small elliptical holes which run the length of a branch, but they won't go out to the outside of the wood, so nothing from the, from the bark side of the tree, if you like, would have a split in it at all. So the exposed surface area of the of the charcoal is much smaller, and that means that when you're using your air controls on your smoker or your grill or whatever, actually it responds to it really quickly and really well. And that, for me, is the essence of, you know, when people are sort of saying, well, I want a charcoal which I can do a long cook with. Do you know, it comes down to two things. It's how good are your air controls mm-hmm. on the appliance you're using and how responsive is your charcoal going to be to those air controls? Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I would, you know, I would sort of think that the, probably the most controllable charcoals that we make as a single species uh, would be birch, um, cherry, that also produces a really dense little charcoal, um, and, uh, and beech probably, but beech would be below birch and cherry. So those would be the easiest to control. But oh, I'd see now I'm going to stop moaning about people. <laughs> 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 but, 
you've also got to think like that, that this is not gas or electricity you know you're not just flicking a switch or turning a knob on and getting a controlled amount of energy like there's a skill in in setting a fire mm -hmm. so you know if you're at home and you're setting a wood fire to in, in your in your hearth just to keep yourself warm in the winter like if you want a fire which is going to produce loads of heat and make you really warm then you're going to stack your wood for that fire so that there's loads of air gaps between it so the air can rush in the thing can really flame and you're going to get a great you know a great reaction the thing's going to burn quickly release loads of energy if you want a fire that's going to sit there and it's just going to sort of you know burn more slowly be in for a long time perhaps you're about to get a bed and you want it to burn till the morning then you're going to want to set your logs so that they are tessellated as well as possible so there's very little air moving through it and the thing will still burn through but it will just do it really slowly like exactly the same thing happens in a barbecue so if you know if i'm setting fire for um you know for, for, for dirty steaks let's say so that's about the hottest thing that i want to do is really get the thing moving then i'm going to select large lumps of charcoal rather than small lumps and i'm going to set them in a way that they're touching but there's great airflow through it um and then you're going to get that you know burning light no one's business and you're going to get a huge temperature from it um and if i wanted to set that same fire and then stick it as a fire that i was going to do a long cook with then i'd be wanting just to throw a bunch of small lump of charcoal into all the holes that I've left uh, for the airflow and just block it up. Um, and the more you can do that, you know, as well as having the air controls on your appliance, you're also controlling your fire, thinking about how you're, how you're putting your fuel together, you know, where, you, where your air index is coming from, you know, have you got too open of... This is really geeky, isn't it? <laughs> well, I hope everyone out there is yeah. taking notes. I certainly am because mm. I'm learning... Uh, me, me and Barbecue Forty are both massive Flumpwood fans. I've actually mm. got about half a crate worth of briquettes sat in my garage from where everyone's talking about briquettes. And I'm going to name them like heat beads and, and Weber briquettes yeah, and, yeah. and stuff like that. And, and I've got about half a crate because I ordered them and never got on with them. I've always been a Lumpwood guy and I'm learning loads here. So, I mean, we keep just saying, oh, we're, we're, we're almost out of charcoal, but... We've actually, we've got loads of stuff there. We just don't want to use it. Yeah, but so much. Like I said, about half a crate of of, uh, of of briquettes, but I just don't want to use it. So I'm like, I don't, I don't mind people if you want to use them. That's fine. But I, I actually, I can, I can get a long, just as long a cook out of my lump of charcoal as I can from the heat beads or anything like that, and, mm. and I can. Yeah. And, and, and I know that from air control, but le learning this stuff from you, I know now that I can go back and actually, I'm going to be able to yeah. advance that way further. Yeah, like, building the fire in different ways is going to help massively. Like when I light my Kamado Joe, I like build a little sort of little tiny pile in the middle with loads of air gaps and everything to get the fire going. Then once it's going yeah. up to temp, then I just whack some coal on top of it and that's it. Then it's trapped yeah. the air down a bit, but... That's a, that's the best way to keep it going then for hours and like from two scoops of lump wood I'll be cooking on that for like six seven hours and it, it's like well can't really beat that can you <laughs> again like a lot of us all like look at look at lump wood and we're like oh yeah we always want the massive pieces I open up a, a box of a box of lump and I'm like oh look at all these big chunks but then to hear actually to hear like those little pieces and stuff they really do have a use yeah. and actually how to use them properly and, and what you can actually do with it. I'd, I'd, this is awesome for me. I, I'm loving life, so please um, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't want to get too dull. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it's a funny thing, and I get that all the time, you know, with people sort of going, oh, we want, you know, we want a big lump of charcoal. So, well, uh, yeah, okay. For some things, that's brilliant, you know. Um, but, um, but not for everything. I mean, so we have, yeah, a large part of our trade is uh, directly to restaurants. Um and when we started uh, here with the Oxford Charcoal Company, we used to grade all of our charcoal out into three separate sizes. Um, so we had like monster lump wood, um, which we, we kind of thought, you know, at the time I was kind of, you know, I'd been convinced into the idea that that was all the restaurant trade wanted was just great big lump wood. Um, and obviously some of the lumps, you know, like if, you, if you're if you running on a little Weber grill or something, you only get two lumps in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So you sort of think, well, it's not much use for, you know, you're not going to be selling that in a, in a, in a box at the, in your local grocery store or whatever. You're right. Some of the lumps you get can't even fit in your chimney style. Like, you yeah, actually just don't sell. <laughs> get your axe out and chop them up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> um, but like for me, I mean, I, I, I really like, you know, what, what, so what I do at the moment is I take um, the, the, the charcoal, so it's, you know, it's, it's made, it's cured, it's ready for grading, and I run it all over a 25 mil um, uh, screen. So I take everything which will fall through a 25 millimeter hole, comes out, and then I use the the rest, the full range, then from twenty five mil up to uh, you know eight inch or whatever, um, and that that's my kind of my go to thing. You know that's why that's why I like to use. And then you just a bit selective when you're setting your fire. You know you know what you want to achieve. Then you just have a bit of a think about what you're about what you're putting on. It doesn't mean I constantly end up with black hands because I can't help myself but from fiddle with the fire. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you know it's just a yeah it's one of those things. You know, I guess. Um, and it, it strikes me that um, we're sort of just, you know, touching on the idea of briquettes. And um, you're absolutely right. You know, people people like what they like and they use what they what they use. I'm not here to try and tell everybody that they're, you know, that what they're doing is wrong or whatever. The only thing that, that occurs to me is, um, like, if you're cooking over a fire, I don't think there's any problem. But with the rising popularity of putting food on your fuel... Um, I would be really careful that you know what's in a briquette. So um, if you're using lumpwood, it's just charcoal. And if you're using a briquette, there's every chance that there's all kinds of binders in it. There's possibly lime in it, which is what gives you the white ash. Um, borax is quite often used to stop the stuff from setting fire to itself when it's being shipped around the world. Like, personally, I wouldn't be a big fan of putting you know, like sort of sticking a steak on top of that or whacking vegetables straight into the coal. Um, but I think you can feel absolutely secure, not just in mine, but any any decent lump wood uh, that you buy, you know, actually cooking directly with with the coals. It's a perfectly safe thing to do, uh, but you do want to know what it is you're burning, you know. Um, yeah, and I think it's sort of like nowadays you buy organic or free range and stuff like that, but still... There are limitations, there's ways around things and stuff like that. So even when I think you're buying these 100% green briquettes and stuff and no fumes and all of this and all of that, and I, I just still like to think that actually you, you never really know because even when you're buying something that's labelled free range in the supermarkets, how, how free range that is or how you imagine free range to be, there are sort of loopholes in the system. So I think like at the same time, I mean, charcoal is under the radar still compared to like your sort of free range chickens and stuff. So what they could probably get away with saying is 100% green stuff is is probably uh, a lot more sort of, uh, do you know what I mean? A bit of a, a wavy line there. I so do. so I don't, I, yeah, I don't know, yeah. even even like closing my lid and smoking with a briquette, I'm still not 100% convinced that the fumes coming off that are 100% natural like you do get from, from Lumpwood. And that's just my opinion. Yeah. That is what I sort of believe and and, and that's as, as I already said like if you want to cook with it that's fine I have no problem with it but that is just my feeling on the subject and, and that's what I just I think to be honest yeah yeah well you know and it's, um, it always strikes me that I'm not you know I never want to uh, my job is not about being negative about about anything about anybody else's product do you know what I mean like I've got plenty of nice things to say about what the better things we do um, and, and I don't want to be you know seen as being prescriptive or you know being being too much of a uh, of a fuel Nazi, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know it's what it is, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I suppose I should also mention that the um, like, talking about you know when you sort of see these marks on uh, on sort of produce that tell you that they're free range or chemical free or you know whatever they are. So we we have um, a uh, an auditing body that we use um, to basically give a check against our sustainability claims. So uh, there's, do you remember a couple of years ago, the government tried to sell all of our forests off and everyone got really cross. Mm. Yep. I don't know whether you paid my attention. I was, you know. <laughs> <it> was <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah. Old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, oh, were, yeah, yeah. we, were, we were out there protesting. Yeah, we, were, we, had our, <laughs> we had our pickets up. We were yeah. like picketing outside 10 Downing Street. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember seeing you there. You yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, had a, we had a nice barbecue afterwards, didn't we? <laughs> Must have done, yeah. I mean, you know, goodness. Um, anyway, so, so the, the upshot of this was that uh, the government, you know, had thought they could have sneakily sell off the uh, national, nationally owned forests and nobody would really care. As it turned out, everybody, you know, people really did care. They had a really big fuss about it. So that led to um, this commission being set up to look at English forestry and what was going on, British forestry and what was going on 
what needed to be done to kind of make the sector a bit more lively you know how could we kind of encourage people into the idea of looking for uh timbers that are sustainably grown in britain and give people the option to you know to choose that so um how did it came an organization called it's very original grown in britain um <laughs> and uh so we've signed up to uh to them as our as our sort of uh, as our licensing body if you like so in order to qualify for that all 80 percent of timber that we use has to come from a woodland which has a five-year management plan in place which talks about biodiversity in the woodland uh it talks about encouraging um flora and fauna in the woodland uh it talks about the sustainable regrowth so anybody that fells a tree under these licenses is duty bound to ensure the regrowth of forest in its place so the forestry commission does all of that there's a brilliant job of uh, putting all the tools in place for people that own forests to do that and then grown in britain links into it so um, we have to be able to show at an annual audit where every single ton of timber that we bought came from. We have to show that we trace that through our system. So when it gets, you know, split into perhaps a, a, a blend of hardwoods or whatever, we know what the constituents are, where they came from, track it through the charcoaling stage, the curing stage, into the bagging stage. So that, you know, that is kind of our, um, our go-to for when people sort of go, oh, yeah, you know, but are you really sustainable? Well, actually, you know, yeah, yeah, we kind of are. And then people wonder why it's 80%. <laughs> because you'd think maybe if I was making a fuss about it, it'd be 100% of wood coming from that. But there are a bunch of things that won't come under that, I wouldn't come under that, um, that, that sort of, um, that policy, if you like, from the Forestry Commission. So if you were um, an orchard, that wouldn't be a forest. So it wouldn't come under the Forestry Commission guidance. Um, so if we wanted to use anything from apple, pear, anything like that, then obviously that's part of our 20%, which is not from a forest. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so every, uh, everything, that still basically, yeah, everything that basically can be from the forest, you are using from the sustainable forest, but that, that 20% yeah, yeah. cushion is, is your experimentation and your, your sourcing from outside of the forest, but still sustainable. So, I mean, you, you yeah, made yeah. that, you made that clear earlier on. And, and I think that's, that's awesome. Staying <laughs> true to yourself and, and stuff like that, which is, which is cool. Excellent. Well, you know, it's sort of nice, yeah, and it's lovely for me now to be in this sort of situation where, uh, yeah, it wasn't all that long ago where if you were talking about these kinds of things, you were appealing to very few people who were very excited about uh, about what you were doing. But the majority of people were just, you know, just not that into it. Now I think it's just changed. You know, everyone's got a bit of an idea that they want to know where, you know, where materials have come from, how they've been sourced. If you're eating meat, you know, you want to know that it's not been kind of dreadfully tortured um, and, you know, had a deep life before it's come to us. Uh, and that's great. And I think, you know, that, that whole appreciation is just, you know, is just running through everything now. I think it's weird, though. Like, they say, like, you eat with your eyes. And now I think it's becoming a bit like I certainly do sort of eat with your ears as well. So I quite like to hear the story mm. about where everything that's on the plates come from. And recently we've been we've been involved in a couple of things where we actually have had some real uh, like a real good story behind the actual meal where everything on the plate actually has a story and they can tell you where it all came from, from Uncle John's farm down the road and they actually went out foraging and picked this wild garlic that's in this whatever. And I just think that actually yeah, yeah. You really appreciate the meal more when yeah. you know exactly so like everything about it. So not only do you eat it. with your eyes and, and want to see a, a fantastically presented dish, yeah, okay, that's great, and it's part of it, but also now I feel well, me, and, me and Barbara Forte certainly are eating with our ears as well, and we want to hear mm. the stories about where everything comes yeah. from, and I think that's important even back to what you're doing with, with the charcoal, what you're cooking with. And I you think take that's... Take the story back even further then, can't yeah. we? You can tell the story where the animals come from. And then we're going on to the wood, right, and which tree it came from. You get a tree? postcard from the tree that <laughs> it came from and stuff, so I think it's pretty... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to get that postcard thing going. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll definitely subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I just see on your website you've got, is it, is it biochar? Is that... Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, can you explain? Yeah, explain what what is that? Is that is that the? Do you know what you're saying about the the less than two point oh, two hundred and fifty mil is is or twenty five yeah. mil? Is that is that what sort of left the charcoal that people can then use in in compost yeah, mixing? Or well, so uh, I mean, charcoal. You know, with again, without wishing to just bang on about the stuff, like it's a it's a remarkable product, charcoal. Um, 
that the first thing that interested me with charcoal was not anything to do with cooking, actually. <laughs> I like it. it just, um, I really like the idea that, uh, so charcoal is our first industrial fuel. And if nobody had ever discovered how to make charcoal, then Bronze Age wouldn't have happened, the Iron Age wouldn't have happened, you know, you couldn't, like, you couldn't have an iPhone, because it all this relies on the fact that we mastered how to make this incredible, incredibly versatile fuel from, from a piece of wood, which is a bloody awful bit of fuel uh, <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, but then, um, once you've got this and you've taken the carbon from a tree and made it into a, you know, a special little thing, it turns out that there are just a million different things that you can do with it, which, uh, you yeah, know, some of which are really quite cool. So, um, yeah, the biochar that we sell right now, the really, there is, uh, the, what we're kind of supplying it for at the moment is, is kind of, uh, yeah, horticulture and, and garden use. And if you put charcoal in soil, um, like, because charcoal is porous and all the way through it, there's you know, loads and loads and loads of holes. So the combined surface area of a very small piece of charcoal is absolutely vast. So when it goes into the soil, uh, all the little microorganisms that live in the soil will go and they'll move into the piece of charcoal and they will be able to proliferate. So you can end up having, you know, I don't know, tens of times more um, life in the soil with, with just 10% of charcoal in it than you would without. And that helps to break down um, all the organic content. So it releases um, uh, uh, nitrogen, potassium, you know, all the things that you're kind of looking at to make your plants grow much more quickly. And then very cleverly, charcoal also manages to absorb all of those things. So um, in a way that they'll only release it back again to a plant root. Um, and it's, yeah, it's quite a cool little thing. So you, basically, you know, it kind of just turbocharges your soil, makes your soil work harder at doing the things that it does naturally anyway. Um, but that's also led me into thinking about loads of different things. So we've recently just done uh, a project with a really great guy, um, uh, architecture student, um, who, who I met, who was interested in incorporating uh, fixed carbon into buildings. So uh, we did a, a char creep project where uh, and we, he poured uh, a floor in a building that he'd been commissioned to, to build uh, and used um, cement, but instead of using sand and gravel or whatever as aggregate, we used charcoal, uh, this sort of 25 mil down product. And it makes the most incredible concrete. It makes the most incredible floor. Uh, and there's five times as much carbon locked up in that floor as it took to make the concrete to, to go into it. Wow. So you've got... Uh, a really big carbon offset in the floor of a house. Mm. And that floor then is 20 times um, more insulated than a standard concrete floor. And for any uh, barbecue lover to have a charcoal floor, I mean, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? Yeah, charcoal uh, patio. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good idea. But it's quite important that you've got the concrete in it. You don't want a charcoal floor <laughs> for your barbecue. <laughs> Pretty quickly, <laughs> um, but I, I, you know the, the thing is this: you know, I mean, the whole of our the whole of our kind of ecosystem, we're just carbon-based life forms kind of floating around the place, aren't we? So the fact that that we respond well to a bit of carbon, it's not that surprising, you know. It's it's got loads of cool things that it does, but of course it does because that's essentially what we are, you know. That's stuff mm. of life, isn't it? Don't people eat it? Uh, don't you eat? Charcoal? Yeah. You can, oh you? goodness! So we have, um, yeah. Well, you know, I work um, work quite a lot with a uh, a lovely little Irish uh, chef called John Rylehan. I don't know if you've come across him in your travels. He was mm. uh, head chef at Barbacoa for a good few years. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But he's off kind of doing his own project now. Um, and he's just set up uh, the most beautiful little restaurant in Cork. Um, so now I'm exporting. Can you imagine mm. <laughs> sending <laughs> coal across the Irish Sea? But um, he came to to cook my crew for for a weekend um a little while ago and did a um cured a salmon with charcoal um and that was just the most amazing thing it never occurred to me you know well wouldn't have ever occurred to me um but he did a, a beetroot and oak charcoal cure on uh on salmon it was just amazing and the flavor you know like no one else would ever know this, but when you uh, when you open a kiln of freshly made charcoal, there is just this overwhelming like the the the, the smell, the aroma that you get coming out is 
just incredible. And it's really hard to recapture that. And I think this was the closest I've ever come to tasting the thing that you smell when you open, you know, when you open that kiln up. Because mm. it's just drawn all of the flavour out and into, and into the fish. Um, and we have a, um, a cheese, uh, a goat cheese maker who uh, grinds our coal and uh, uses it to coat um, freshly made uh, goat's cheeses before they age them because the charcoal will stop the cheese from oxidizing because it will absorb um, oxygen and stop it from getting into the cheese. Um, and then, yeah, so there are, I don't know, we've got bunches of people who are, who are using charcoal in their cooking, but not actually as a fuel, mm. um, either as a cure or, or you know, very, very finely grating it into foods. Um, but of course, you know, there's always been charcoal biscuits uh, have been pretty popular for, for a very long time. Um, so you can, you know, you can go into Sainsbury's and buy, and buy um, you know, crackers for cheese, which are, which are made with charcoal in them. Um, as a sort of aid to digestion and what have you. Yeah. So yeah, you know, honestly, you can just keep buying it from me, guys. Yeah. Uh, you can do it cool. tonight with it. Yeah. <laughs> do it one with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to have to give this cure in a go. I'm going to have yeah. to go on and check out that and definitely mm. give that a go because that's that sounds really really interesting to me. And it, I don't know. It sort of brings me back to I've heard Christian DJ Barbecue talking about you before and, and sort of how you've changed the way he cooks and the way he looks at, at wood and charcoal and fuel. And just in this sure. this hour episode, like yep. you've, you've changed completely us. changed <laughs> changed the way I think about it all, <laughs> yeah. and, and the way I'm going to approach it when I when I get back home tonight because I'm doing a bit of an epic cook tonight. So it's oh, are you? I don't know. It's like uh, yeah, I, I think it's just been awesome. It's it's been an hour episode, but we could easily go on and listen to you for for hours on end. This is this has been absolutely epic. Uh, My basket's full <laughs> already off your website now, so it's, we better stop talking <laughs> oh, before you keep selling me any more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So, let's get some of this orange wood. Oh, actually, now I need some birch. Oh, beech <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I know. All of it's good. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i just stick one of <laughs> each in, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might as well. You yeah. might as well. All good. <laughs> so, I'm just wondering, for, for, the, for the curing, just before, I, I know we've already gone over and I'm, like, I'm still asking questions. I'm so intrigued. So, so like for the curing, would you advise to get like the biochar? Would, would that probably be the best to go with or...? Um, well, do you know what? Um, I, what I've seen most people doing, and again, you know, I wouldn't want to try and pretend that I'm some kind of chef or anything. It's just what I pick up from what other people are doing. But you know those, um, are they called microplanes that a lot of chefs have? Um, really small little micro graters. Mm. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Might use for nutmeg or yeah, things like that. Grinding yeah, up yeah. ginger or something like that. Yeah, that kind of thing. Mm. So uh, it seems that what people are mostly doing is using uh, a little sort of, you know, a kind of a good quality little um, little grater and grating it down to actually quite a fine particle. Mm. So I think ideally you want a lump to start off with because you don't want to, you know, grate your fingers off in the process. Uh, <laughs> and you'll find as well that different woods, you know, are, are different, you know, charcoal from different woods lends itself more easily to being broken down. To, to that kind of thing. Mm. So, um, like, this is a, you know, back to birch is quite hard charcoal. You have a, you know, you have a job to get that ground down finely. Uh, oak lends itself to going to a powder very easily. Uh, so does sweet chestnut. In fact, all of the charcoals that you would historically have used to blow up the French, uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we could use something like a coffee grinder or something. Would, would that, I mean, that yeah. would sort of yeah, get you yeah. a... Careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah start a little fire in there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculously abrasive. So you know, if you're, if you, <laughs> unless it's somebody else's coffee grinder. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah we're going to start getting sent bills yeah. for coffee grinders yeah. now. I did not say that. Do not use a coffee grinder, but I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I tell you what, I'll try and get. Um, I'll have a word with uh, with with Mr. John Rylan and see if I can't get him to pop the recipe together for that salmon cure. Yeah, that'd um, be awesome. And I'll, I'll whack, it on, uh, whack it on the website. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a really cool thing, you know, and it, uh, yeah, just I, I really appreciated you know, what he'd done to draw those flavours out. It'd be kind of a, a cool thing to share. So awesome. could, you could start selling a dust instead, couldn't you? Oh, Charcoal yeah, dust added it. to the website. <laughs> Yeah. I'll claim that one. Yeah. <laughs> you can uh, you can have that as long as you brand it United Q barbecue <laughs> dust. 
<laughs> oh dear. Right, I am actually going to have to call call it an end there because we are we're we're over our hour. I'm going to have to say that that's it. We're going to have to end it there. But I can feel like a video well, podcast coming on sometime. Yeah, I'd love feel, to come up and see these kilns in action. Yeah, and I could definitely see maybe get, oh, well, trying to get you on for another episode at mm. some point because this is awesome. Yeah, well, you guys are very welcome. You know, if ever you're coming past Oxford, come and have a come and have a, a look at what we're up to. Yeah, we'll make um, sure we are. <laughs> and I would imagine I'm going to see you out on the circuit this year. I'll be out with um, the DJ Barbecue Pit Crew again. So um, I doubtless we'll bump into each other at various uh, sort of food food grilling events through the Definitely. season. Definitely. Yeah, I saw he was in London looking at outfits for you guys. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're all going to be dressed know, up as yeah. this year. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I think that's going to be amazing, yeah. I, I, I kind of really hope that the rabbit head was for me. If anyone's seen the pit game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm a little worried that they're a bit combustible. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you're going to have to stock up on a few tins tin of flame retardant or something. I wonder which one of you is going to be wearing that dress. That was yeah. that was what. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to say, I do look pretty good in the frock. <laughs> yeah. Right, Matt, thank well, you so much for coming on, mate. It's been absolutely epic. I've learned hundreds and I'm sure everyone else has so thank you so so much and yeah well, we can't wait to see you thank you very much for having me guys I do appreciate it thank you very much see thank you later you. on cheers mate so thanks for tuning in guys we've recorded yet another awesome podcast to get you over hump day as always we're brought to you by Pro-Q Barbecue Gourmet and Smokewood Shack are awesome sponsors. Pro-Q is dedicated to providing you with quality smoking products with top-notch service and free advice for beginners to pitmasters. You can find them on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram under Pro-Q Smokers. So if you're thinking about buying your first smoker or looking to upgrade or even looking to pick up some epic accessories, check them out over at Max Barbecue. And Barbecue Gourmet is devoted to promoting real barbecue and supplying the UK and Europe with top championship winning barbecue rubs, sauces, marinades and accessories from the United States and around the world. And you can find them on Twitter and online under Barbecue Gourmet. So regardless of how you cook, whether it's on charcoal, wood, gas or electric, the real taste of barbecue can be yours all year round. And Smokewood Shack delivers quality smoking wood every time. They provide the smoky goodness and you provide the talent. So if you are looking for smoking wood chunks, dust, chips or planks, then head over to smokewoodshack.com and you can find them on Twitter at Smokewood Shack. Any questions you've got, fly them over there and they'll be happy to help. So goodbye from me and goodbye from me. See you next time, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye.